I think there's a possibility that one could um, put a lot of really kind of uncommercial abstract music uh, and make it accessible to people who wanted to download it. Um, that's kind of what I want to do in the future, and I, I will do, I think. As you get older, does it matter to you less if your albums sell, or is that still? Confusing? I seem to have a core audience uh, who sort of kept me above water all these years. But I'm not. I'm not a big album seller. I never have been. Um, I think what I contributed to music and sort of what I did to how rock can look probably has been my contribution more than, say, Foreigner, who sell at their peak were selling millions and millions of albums. I'm not a million, you know, I'd about the same kind of sales as Dylan. You know, neither of us are album sellers. But over a period of time, that's not entirely true because over 20 years, the albums sell an extraordinary amount. But they're not, I think maybe there's, uh, I'm not so known for immediacy in the albums. There's some, so often they take quite some time to get into. They're not sort of happy little jingles that are top of the pops, you know. Um, just one more question about the net. Do you see, what do you see as the potential for that? I mean, in in which way? In what way? People always seem to be curious about what what its uses are, other than connecting people, which is not necessarily a good thing. In the uses of the net, blackmail and sex, I think, predominantly. <laughs> Definitely seems to me. Um, like, did you get any satisfaction out of releasing it on the net? You did because people could. It's all right. It's just another tool. I'm not wildly excited about it. I mean, it's not. I don't really sleep over it. I mean, it's, it's all right. It's just there's, you know, like a typewriter. I, I, it doesn't impress me that much. Uh, I much prefer the programs that you can buy for the computer, and I like making art on the computer. I like fooling around with uh, Photoshop and Kid Picks and Painter and things like that, and constructing my own works. But just to eavesdrop on other people's conversations or whatever doesn't really fascinate that much. But of course, when we're on tour and we have all those dreadful hours waiting between shows, we spend half the time getting comments on the last night's show, which sort of appear immediately, which is actually very instructive. And uh, keep those messages coming in because it, it really helps to define where the interaction is between ourselves and our audience. Uh, so I, I, I like that aspect of it. Feed, immediate feedback is great on, on the net. And there, um, it was in the bio, it's being like giving them a spiritual vibe to the album and the song Seven Years in Tibet. I know you've been interested in Buddhism, and we see, we're starting to see maybe a resurgence of that. I mean, we've got Adam Yelka, the Beastie Boys, yes. got three Tibet festivals going on. Yeah. A lot of Hinduism and, and Indian music is starting to come up, Kula Shaker and Eddie Vedder from that. Can you describe your own interest in Well, I'm a closet, sh closet, sh I don't know if I'm a closet shaman or a closet holy man. <laughs> when, I was eight, when I was about 18, um, I, I studied Tibetan Buddhism for about two or three years, and I had a teacher called Chimmy Yangdung Rinpoche, who had just come over from Tibet and led his own followers over. The majority of them, sadly, were shot by the Chinese as they made their exit from Tibet down into India. He started off, I think, something like 2,000 followers and ended up with 50 or 60 because the helicopters would come out there and shoot them off, like play, like shooting deer or something. Um, but he fortunately came through and he really in, in, sort of tried to guide me into an, uh, some kind of informed opinion about Buddhism. I wouldn't say that I was a very good Buddhist. Um, but he actually, he eventually told me to continue exert myself in music and not run off and get my hair cut off and become a llama. What is a good Buddhist? What? What is a good Buddhist? What makes one good? A good Buddhist? Well, somebody that even tries. <laughs> <laughs> but the one thing that he left me with was a sense of transience and change, uh, which actually became fundamentals to my life, my approach to it, and not holding on to anything, not considering that there is anything that will last through one's entire eternal life, living or dead. And it makes letting go very easy, M material things or physical things. Uh, and looking for the source of one's own being becomes much more important. And I guess that's been sort of my, my own personal journey 
is, is trying to sort out where my spiritual bounty lies, where my thread to a universal order lies, and that that becomes that can become a life search. And I think that's as a writer probably what I involve myself in more than anything else. And uh, but coming back to the Tibet thing, uh, I think watching over the last couple of years how vocal and articulate the Dalai Lama has been. Um, informing and educating people what's happened in Tibet and what what's at stake has sort of prompted my guilt to a certain extent that I had such a strong interest in Tibet when I was young and I, it seems to have dissipated or been relinquished somehow over the years that it prompted me into writing something about that particular situation and in fact we just did uh, the other day in Toronto uh, a recording for an album um, which will be the, the, the funds of which will go towards the Tibetan refugees um, and we, uh, we wrote and recorded a little song the other day I think that album comes out a couple of about six weeks time I think. there was a wonderful story I read somewhere about um, you going to Kyoto and, and someone telling you that something about organized religion is of the past and that this yeah. person is going to come through people like you well, I'm not sure that he quite meant people like me, but I think he felt. Yes, it was um, it was a Zen uh, a Zen teacher at a temple that I I like a lot in in Kyoto, and uh, he's not he's not often there. I I usually see the the, the sort of the uh, a lot of the other uh, masters who are there. But the, we had we were fortunate enough to have lunch with them last time we were there, and. It was most peculiar, out of nowhere, he suddenly said, religion is over, and it lies in the arts, that the information in spiritual life will be in the vessel of the visual and the musical arts, which I thought was quite a stunning comment from this 70-year-old Zen master. Uh, I'm not sure that I ha have his optimism. <laughs> yeah, I actually sort of do. I sort of feel you do? that way. I, I think less and less people at least in my life, are involved in organized religion. Maybe not oh, I, no, I agree with that. I agree with you there, absolutely. I think people are letting go of the idea of organ. I think, I can't remember who the philosopher was, but in the early part of the century, um, it, it, he said that we have to kill God to reinvent him. And I think that is very much playing itself out in the later part of this century. Um, I think we have to find the focus of, of where our religious strength lies in an entirely different area from the, the archaic and almost medieval forms that we're sort of expected to supplant ourselves to. Yeah. I think the beauty of it may lie in that it comes from within each the powers, within each everyone, rather than in the old structure, it was like the power lies in the priest <coughs> or the rabbi or the, the power figure in re-empowering everyone. And I think popular culture can help that in a way. Yeah, I agree there, but I think we're finding the materials of a new religion, but I think we have to find and develop a new kind of discipline. I think there is no real sense of purpose without a shaping of fragments. I think we have the fragments and the pieces of a new way, a new, uh, a new way. But I think we have to construct a path out of those pieces. I think we have the bits of concrete and it's merely crazy paving at the moment. But it will, it, we have to develop a form. Presumably that's what we'll be doing in our new millennium, is developing the form. We have the material. Um, I think we're getting to wrap up with this one last question. Um, Aliens have saturated our culture, whether it's just little blips on people's sweatshirts, backpacks, stories. Perot. Do you, what, what's your take on that? Do you have an opinion? Are they real, or is it some cultural phenomenon? I feel like a traitor, but I'm sort of indifferent to it. <laughs> it's, uh, for me, that it only ever represented spiritual search. I mean, I, I, I don't, uh, I'm not madly uh, obsessed about the thing. in terms of hardware, science fiction hardware. Um, I tend to have just used the idea of the alien or the otherness of beings as to pinpoint a sense of isolation or alienation, which is slightly, you know, sort of more, more of a psychological thing. And, uh, and they became ciphers for that more. 
Um, but the idea, you know, is the life on Mars. I could care less. <laughs> Thank you very much. My pleasure. <laughs>